Lesson 7 A Midsummer Night's Dream by William Shakespeare. The dramatist persona. These are the people that are the characters in the play. Theseus. Theseus. Athens. Aegeus. Aegeus is the father of Hermia. Lysander and Demetrius are in love with Hermia. Philosprit is the master of the revels to Theseus. He is in charge of entertainment in the palace of Theseus. Quince is a carpenter. Snap is a joiner. Bottom is a weaver. Flute is a bellows mender. Snout is a tinker. Stavlin is a tailor. And these are the actors in the play that is performed within the play. Hippolyta. Hippolyta is a queen of the Amazons who, who was betrothed to Theseus after their capture. Hermia is the daughter of Aegeus, and he is in love, she is in love with Lysander. Helena is in love with Demetrius. Oberon is a king of the fairies. Titania is a queen of the fairies. Puck is also known as Robin Goodfellow. He is the, the fairy that follows Oberon. He wow. serves Oberon. Peace, Blossom, Cobweb, Moth, Master Seed, these are all fairies. And there are other fairies that attend to uh, their king and their queen. Of course, there are attendants also who attend to Theseus and Hippolyta. Now, as you may know, fairies are small creatures, mystical creatures believed to have the ability to, to do so many things, including turning themselves into one thing or another. This is a summary of Act 1, Scene 1. Theseus and Hippolyta, the wedding which is to take place in four days. Theseus sends Philostrate to round up entertainers to while away the time. Aegeus brings his daughter Hermia and her two suitors Lysander and Demetrius to Theseus to settle an argument. Hermia wants to marry Lysander. Aegeus wants her to marry Demetrius. Theseus gives Hermia three choices, marry Demetrius, enter a nunnery, or be put to death for disobedience. Hermia has until the day of Theseus' wedding to come to a decision. Lysander and Hermia plan to meet in the woods the next night and elope. Helena, who loves Demetrius and is a lover's friend, decides she will tell Demetrius of their plans so she can be with him while he looks for Hermia and Lysander. Act 1, Scene 1 Athens, Palace of Theseus. So Act 1 takes place at Athens in the Palace of Theseus. And I would want you to do this for all the acts. Just write down, prepare a table uh, that will have the 
settings as well as the characters of all the scenes. So, for example, you write Act 1, Scene 1, then the settings will be Athens, the palace of Theseus. Then you list down the characters that are in this particular scene. And you do the you same for all the various scenes. This way, it will be easy to always remember the settings of all the scenes, as well as the characters that were present in each scene. Now, to the play, Act 1, Scene 1, Theseus. Now, fair Hippolyta, our nuptial address on a pace. For happy days bring in another moon. But, oh, methinks how slow this old moon wanes. She lingers my desires like to a step game or a dowager, long withering out a young man revenue. So Theseus tells Hippolyta that in four days the, 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 the month will end, and then that means their wedding will come on around that time, on that day. But then he thinks the, the days are moving too slowly. He wants the the days to move quickly so that their wedding day would come and he compares the 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 way the days are moving slowly to the way a young man is waiting for uh, what is due him but the the the, the stepmother is actually delaying it whatever is due the, the young man as the father is dead whatever is due him the, the stepfather is delaying it. He compares that delay to the way the day is not moving fast enough for their wedding day to come quickly. Hippolyta. Four days we quickly steep themselves in night. Four nights we quickly dream away the time. And then the moon, like to a silver bow, new bent in heaven, shall behold the night of our solemnities. So Hippolyta assures, assures Theseus that, oh, the four days will quickly go, will quickly pass as each of them turn to a night. And once they turn to night, nights move so quickly because they are dreamed away. And here Hippolyta begins to give us hints of the title of the play. Remember the title of the play? The Midsummer Nights. Dream, and he says the days will turn to night, and when they are night, it is in the night that we dream, and when we dream, time moves quickly. Theseus, go illustrate, stir up the Athenian youth to marry my pet and nimble spirit of myth. Turn to funerals, the pale companion is not for our pump. So Theseus sends philosophy to go to the cities, uh, to go to the streets and tell the people to start rejoicing and that everybody should should be happy that sorrow should not be allowed because sorrow is reserved for funerals but the time that is coming there should be all enjoyments and so Philo Street leaves Hippolyta I woo thee with my sword and warn thy love doing thee injuries but I will I will wed thee in another key with pomp, with triumph, and with revelling. So he now tells Hippolyta that yes, he got her through he got her through a battle, but he's going to wed her in another way. He's going to wed her, he's going to marry her in pomp and pageantry, with with entertainment all over. Now this has got got Hippolyta after they defeated the Amazons, then he chose what to do with their queen. And he chose to marry their queen, who is Hippolyta. And that is what he's talking about. Now, as they are talking, Edius and Tess, Edius and Tess with Hermia, Lysander, and Demetrius. Edius. Happy be Theseus, our renowned duke. Theseus. Thanks, goody juice. What a nose with thee? Full of vexation come I, with complaint against my child, my daughter Hermia. 
Stand forth, Demetrius, O the Lord, this man hath my consent to marry her. Stand there, and my gracious duke, this man hath been with the bosom of my child. Thou, thou, Lysander, thou hast given her rhymes and interchanged love tokens with my child. Thou hast by moonlight at her window sung with feeling voice, with feeling voice, verses of feeling love, and stolen the impression of her fantasy with bristles of thy hair, rings, girls, conceits, nuts, trifles, nosegays, sweetmeats, messengers of strong prevailment in unhardened youth. With cunning hast thou flicked my daughter's heart. Tend her obedience, which is due to me, to stubborn harshness. And my gracious duke, be it so she will not hear before your grace consent to marry with Demetrius. I beg the ancient privilege of Athens, as she is mine, I may dispose of her. We shall be either to this gentleman or to her death according to our law immediately provided in that case. Artisio says he comes in anger. Uh, Edu says he comes in anger. And he comes to make complaints about her daughter. That he came with two men, that is Lysander and Demetrius. So he informed the Duke that this man, Demetrius, is the man that I have chosen for my daughter to get married to. But then this other man, Lysander, has bewitched, has deceived my daughter and this man has sung uh, poems and songs and has interchanged love to kings with my child he has given my daughter gifts and other things that has made my daughter more interested in her he has sung by my daughter's window uh, at night with voices pretending to love my daughter he has sung poems he has, give, he has given her gifts. He has given her trinkets. He has given her uh, little presents, flowers, toys, candies. But through these things, he has impressed upon my daughter. And this caused my daughter to disobey me. So that the disobedience that the obedience owes to me has turned rather to him. And my, my daughter now is stubbornly harsh to me. And so, my duke, he says, let it be known to my daughter now that if he will not agree to marry Demetrius, who I have chosen for her, then the law, the ancient law, the old law of Athens must work. For according to the law, she is mine, and I choose what to do with her. According to the, the laws of Athens, a child belongs to the father, and so the father decides or chooses what to do with her daughter. And so, it just says, by that law, he has to choose what would become of the daughter. And he chooses that the daughter must marry Demetrius. And if he refuses to marry Demetrius, then it is either she gets, it is either she dies, if she, if she refuses to marry Demetrius, then it is simple. She must die as I choose. To die. Jesus. What say you, Hermia? Be advised, fair day. Your father should be as a god. One that composed your beauties. Yeah. Ah, but as a form in wax. By him imprinted and within his power to lead the figure or to lead the figure, it's Demetrius is a worthy gentleman. So Jesus advises Hermia to be careful because he, her father should be to her like a god. Whatever her father decides, it should be it. Whatever her father says, that is what the young maiden must do. After all, whatever you are made of, whatever your duties, you have only gotten them from your father. So to her, to, to your father, you are like wax, you are like clay. Moles you into whatever he wants. He can he can make you he can make you and he cannot make you. He can destroy you and he can now help me. And then ask that. After all, Demetrius 
is a man. It's gentle enough to get married. It's appropriate. It's noble enough to get married to you. And Hermia responds that so is love. Hermia responds that well, Lysander is also a worthy gentleman. And Tizio says, in himself he is, but in this kind, wanting your father's voice, he has beheld the worthier. So Tizio advises Hermia that yes, it is true that Lysander is also a worthy gentleman, but then, in this particular case, Lysander doesn't have your father's consent to marry you. So for that reason, Demetrius is more is, is more appropriate. It is more appropriate to get married to Demetrius because he has your father's consent. Hermia. I would my father looked back with my eyes. So Hermia says, I wish my father would look at things not with her not with his own eyes, but with my eyes. Because after all, she's the one who's going to get married to the person. He's the one who's going to stay with the person. So she would want to also have a, a say in the choice. And I believe many of you today will certainly agree with Hermia because you would certainly also believe you must choose who to marry. In those days, the father's consent was extremely important of husband and in everything because your father tests so much. Tisius. Rather your eyes must with his Tisius says no. Rather your eyes with his judgment look. Tisius says no. It is rather proper that you let your father's eyes you and you should see through your father's eyes. I do entreat your grace to pardon me. I know not by what power I am made bold. It concern my modesty in such a presence here to plead my thoughts. But I beseech your grace that I may know the worst that may befall me in this case if I refuse to wed Demetrius. Help me now ask. I beg your pardon. Permit me to ask this. I don't know what has made me so bold to speak before people like this in this situation. And I don't know how this affects my, my modesty, the, 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 the propriety of things. I don't know how it affects us. But beg, I beg you to allow me to ask one thing, to bring out my thoughts. In case I refuse to marry Demetrius, who my father wants me to marry. What is the worst thing that could possibly happen to me? Jesus. Either to die the death or to abjure forever the of men. Therefore, fair Hermia, question your desires. Know of your youth. Examine well your blood. Whether if you yield not to your father's choice, you can endure the life of a nun. For I to be in shady closet, cloistered mute. So Tisio still said, Well, the consequence would be either to die or never to marry. So he advises this, uh, he advises Hermia, assess your desires well, check yourself very well whether you will be able to bear the consequences if you reject your face, whether you can be okay now. Oh yes, and in a shady mood, to live a barren sister all your life, chanting faint hymns to the cold, fruitless moon. This blessed they that must have sowed their blood, and a ghost that made in pilgrimage, but earthly happy is the world than that which withering on the virgin thorn grows and dies in single pleasantness. So he, adv he advises her, well, are you ready to live as a nun, as a barren, never to give birth all your life, singing hymns in a convent, in a night, at night, alone, singing hymns. Oh, yes. if you are able to endure this and undergo such a pilgrimage of becoming a nun, 
And of course, the one that decides to marry in the in the gets earthly happiness as it would not continue to remain as his virginity like the rose will be distilled and they will not have to grow and live and die in singleness in his virginity so he advises Hermia so will I go, so will I grow, so live, so die, my lord, ere I will up unto this, unto his lordship, whose unwished yoke my soul consents not to give sovereignty. So he says, well, so be it, so live and die like that, rather than to give myself to somebody I am not ready to submit myself to. So it is you. Take time to pause, and by the next new moon, the ceiling day betwixt my love and me, for everlasting bond of fellowship, upon that day either prepare to die for disobedience to your father's will, or else to wed Demetrius as he would, or on Diana's altar to protest for I austerity and single life. So he advises this as well. In four days' time, when the new moon comes, that is when I'm going to have my wedding with Hippolyta. Now, on that day, prepare, think about it carefully, and on that day, bring me an answer. But on that day, prepare either to get married to Demetrius or to die according to your father's wish or to remain a nun all the rest of your life. Demetrius. You learn, sweet Hermia, and Lysander. Yield thy great title to my certain right. So Demetrius now comes in and advises, advises Hermia, advises Lysander to forget about his crazy love and allow him to marry the girl. Then Lysander comes in. Well, you have her father's love. Let me have Hermias. Do you marry him? So, Lysander tells him it was well. The father loves you. The girl loves me. Therefore, marry the father. Let me marry the girl. Scornful Lysander, he hath my love. And what is mine, my love shall render him. And she is mine. And all my right of her I do estate unto Demetrius. So now, well, you, want, you want to be scornful. Well, whether you like it or not, yes, I love Demetrius. And what is mine, I give it willingly to Lysander. Therefore, she is mine. And so I am giving my right of her to Lysander. To Demetrius, sorry. Lysander. I am my lord as well derived as he, as well possessed by my, my love is more than his. My fortunes every way as fairly ranked, if not with vantage, as Demetrius. And which is more than all these books can be, I am beloved of beauteous Hermia. Why should not I then prosecute my right? Demetrius, I uh, vouch it to his maid love to Neda's daughter Helena, and warn her soul, and she, sweet lady, dotes, devoutly dotes, dotes in idolatry upon this sported and inconstant man. Now Lysander says, Well, I am as qualified as Demetrius. Only my love is more than his. Probably what I have, my, my, my wealth probably is, 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 is ranked as equally as that of Demetrius, if not more than. And what is more important in all of these things we are talking about, the lady loves me. So why shouldn't I get her? Why shouldn't I get her? All right. Then he now says, Demetrius here, I swear, 
even right before his presence, has proposed love to Neda's daughter, Helena. And Helena has fallen in with this same Demetrius. Helena is head, head over heels in love with this same Demetrius. Helena now even if this, this same Demetrius like a god. This man is simply nice. How can he propose to somebody and the person is seriously in love with her and then with him and then he now claims he's in love with Hermia also. Jesus. I must confess that I have heard so much, and with Dimitrius thought to have spoke thereof, but being in affairs, my mind did lose it. But Dimitrius, come, and come, you shall go with me, I have some private schooling for you both. For you, fair Hermia, look you arm yourself to fit your fancies to your father's will, or else the law of Athens use you up, which may extend weight to death or to a vow of single life. Come here, come. What cheer, my love? Demetrius and Aegeus, go along. I must employ you in some business against our nuptia and confer with you of something nearly that concerns yourselves. So now Jesus says, yes, I have also heard about that. I have also heard that Demet what Lysander is saying and even wanted to call Demetrius to talk over uh, those issues with with him, but I have been so busy with personal affairs that I forgot. Now, he calls Demetrius and Aegeus to come with him because he has something to discuss with the two of them concerning their, their, uh, their wedding that is coming off, and then uh, some too concerning they themselves. After that, now he advises Hermia to continue thinking about it and forget about his fancies and then listen to his father what uh, do what his father wants otherwise the law of Athens would work and he's not ready to bring down the law of Athens he's not ready to to tempt it to to, to temper justice with mercy no he's going to execute the law as it is either that she dies or become single for all the rest of her life. Then afterwards she calls Hippolyta, then goes with her together with Demetrius and Aegeus. Aegeus, with Dito and Desire, we follow you. So they followed, that is Lysander, uh, Aegeus and Demetrius followed Theseus. Excellent also, everybody leaves, leaving Lysander and Hermia alone. Lysander. How now, my love? Why is your cheek so pale? How chance the roses there do fade so fast? So Lysander observes that Hermia's face, her cheek, had become a question said about that. Hermia. Be like for want of rain, which I could well between bete between them from the tempest of said probably because uh, I need to share some tears. Lysander, I ah, mean, for aught that I could ever read, could ever hear my tale or history, the course of true love never did run smooth. But either it was different. So now he tells. Now he tells. Um, Lysander tells Hermia that, oh, don't worry, for all that I have, all that I have ever heard from stories of history, eh, from stories and from history, true love has always, true love has never gone smoothly. It has always suffered in one way or the other. There might only have been differences in the way it happened, but true love has consistently faced one trouble or Another. Hermia, oh, cross too high to be enthralled too low. So, Hermia, Hermia also admits, as Lysander says, or else misgrift in respect of years. And Hermia says, Sometimes it may be that one is too high, is too high for the other. 
Sander asked that sometimes the difference might be in terms of age. One might be too old for the other. For the other. Oh, spite, too old to be engaged, too young, Lysander, or else it stood upon the choice of friends, Hermia, or her own another's eyes. So he says sometimes it may be, um, by the, because maybe society doesn't allow you to, to have such association with this person or that person. And Hermia says, well, it is her, if, you have to choose love, not by your own eyes, but his eyes. Or if there were a sympathy in joy, or death, or sickness, did lay siege to it, making it moment, momentary as a shadow, short as any dream, brief as the lightning in the cold night, that in a spleen of foes both heaven and earth. And ere a man had power to say, Behold, the jaws of darkness do devour it up. So quick, bright things come to confusion. So Lysander at that time, even when eventually the the either of these things happen or when they, they are able to come, something else comes to separate them. Either war or death or sickness comes to separate them. And sometime before you could say Jack, everything just ends so quickly. It becomes everything just dies out as swift as a shadow, as short as a dream. As brief as lightning in the in the in the night in the sky, and before you could say Jack, everything ends. Confusion comes. And if then true lovers have been ever crossed, it stands as an edict in destiny. Then, then let us teach our trial patience, because it is a customary cross as due to love as thoughts and dreams and sighs, wishes and tears, poor poor fancies followers. So Hermia says, well, if that is the case, then we must learn to be patient as we go through this trial of true love. Because it is the customary thing, it is the usual thing that happens when there is true love. Listen now. A good persuasion. Therefore, hear me, Hermia. I have a widow aunt, a dowager of great revenue, and she had no child. From Athens is a house remote, even, even seven leagues, and she respects me as her only son. There, gentle Hermia, may I marry thee, and to that place the sharp Athenian law cannot pursue us. If thou lovest me, then, Steal forth thy father's house tomorrow night, and in the wood a league without the town. I did meet thee once with Helena to do of me, then will I stay. So now, Lysander tells him that is a right attitude. That is a good attitude, is a good persuasion. Therefore, Listen to me. I have an aunt who is a widow, very rich, and doesn't have any child. This my aunt lives about two atoms. She takes me for her son. I want us to go there, and there I will marry you. Over there, the, 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 the sharp laws, the strict laws of Athens cannot reach us, cannot chase us. Hermia, if you love me, tomorrow night, run away from your father's house. Run away from your father's house and meet me in the forest a few miles out of this town. At that place where some time ago, I met you together with Helena to celebrate May Day. Wait for you at that place tomorrow night so that you could elope. So Lysander brings the idea of elopement. In those days, elopement were, elopements were quite common. 
whenever people people the one they want and the, and the fathers will not they elope that they run away from the air to another place where the loss of that town or city does not uh, cannot and once they go and get married there they are married hosts so Lysander break of eloping to get married outside Athens. My Lysander, I swear to thee by Cupid's strongest bow, by his best arrow with the golden head, by the simplicity of Venus doves, by that which nature soothes loves, and by that fire which burn the queen, and the false trion and that sail was seen by all the vows that ever men have broke in number more than ever women spoke in that same place thou hast appointed me tomorrow truly will i meet hermia agrees and swears by everything that he could swear he swears by cupid's bow which is a god of love usually um, pictured as a boy a little boy blindfolded with a with bow and arrow and it is believed that if he shoots that strong bow that golden bow at you you fall in love and when he shoots that golden arrow at you you fall in love and he swears by Cupid he also swears by Venus and the, love, the doves of Venus, the god of love. Everything that brings souls together and by everything that brings love that he's going, she's going to indeed be there to meet Lysander. Keep promise, love. Look, here comes Helena. And as they are talking, they see Helena coming. Helena. God speak fair, Helena. Wither away. So, Helena greet Helena. Says, Hello, beautiful Helena. Where are you going? Helena. Call you me fair? That fair again and say, Demetrius loves fair. Oh, happy fair. Your eyes are lord stars, and your hair more tunable than luck to shepherd's ear. When wheat is green, when hawthorn buds appear, sickness is catching. Oh, where favor would, would I cut? Fair Hermia, here I go. My ear should catch your voice, my eye your eye, my tongue should catch your tongue's sweet melody. Well, mine, Demetrius being ba being baited, the rest I'll give to be to you translated. Oh, teach me how you look, at you sway the motion of Demetrius' heart. So Helena says, did you just call me beautiful? Take it back, don't even call me beautiful. Demetrius loves you. Oh, you are so lucky. Your eyes are like stars. And your voice is more musical than the song. The luck. Just the luck here referring to the sky luck. A bird that is, that is, that is known to sing so well that I loves the sound of the sky luck. Somebody who sings so well can be referred to as a skylark. And your voice is, is, is more than a meal of the, of, of the lark to a shepherd in the springtime. Sickness is contagious. When sickness comes, it catches people. Oh, I wish beauty was as contagious as sickness may be. If it were so, oh, I would want to cut you. I would infected. I would want my ears to be infected with your ears. I would want my eyes to be infected with your eyes. I would want my tongue to be infected with your with your tongue. Please teach me. 
Is it me? If it were possible, the whole world were mine, I would give it up to anybody who would enable me to get Demetrius. I would give up everything except Demetrius to be you. Oh, teach me. Show me how you look that you used to win the heart of Demetrius. Amen. I frown upon him, yet he loves me. He says, well, I run upon him, yet he loves me. Oh, that your frowns would teach my smiles such skill. How I wish your smile so that he would love me too. I give him curses, yet he loves me. Oh, that my... The more I hate, the more he follows me. The more I love, the more he hated me. Observes. His folly, Helena, is no fault of mine. None but your beauty were mine. So Helena says, Helena says, it is, it is, it is not me. It's not my fault. And Helena says, yes, it is not your fault. It is the fault of your beauty. The fault of yours were mine. Helena, take comfort. He no more shall see my face. Lysander and myself will fly this place before the time I did Lysander see. Seemed Athens as a paradise to me. Oh, then, what graces in my love do dwell, that he had turned the hip. So Helena t t tells Lysa, uh, Helena, well, don't worry, take heart, because very soon he will not even, he says, before, uh, and so because very soon Lysander and I will leave this place. He tells uh, Helena, before I saw uh, Lysander, this place, Athens, but now look, has become like a hell to me. Lysander. Helen, to you out. Tomorrow night, when Phoebe donned her silver visage in the watery glass, decking with liquid pearl the bladed grass, a time that lovers' flights doth still, still conceal, through Athens' gates have we devised to steal. So he tells Helena that where well, we will tell you our plan. That is tomorrow night, when the night comes, when the moon is there. At that time, when lovers normally run away, we have planned to run away from Athens. Amen. And in the wood, where often you and I, upon thin primrose beds, were wont to lie, emptying our bosoms of their counsel sweet, there my Lysander and myself shall meet. And then from Athens turn away our eyes to seek and stranger companies. Farewell, sweet playmate, please, sweet playfellow. Pray thou for us, and good luck grant thee thy Demetrius. Keep word, Lysander, we must from lover's food till morrow deep midnight. So now, I also adds that yes, at that very place where you and I have often been spending time, Telling other sweet secrets, telling each other sweet secrets. That's where Lysander and I will meet. And from there, we will run away from Athens and make new friends, get new company. And he bids, she bids Helena goodbye. He asks Helena to pray for them. Then he turns to Lysander and asks Lysander to keep his promise. And that they need to stay away from each other until tomorrow night when they meet in the bush. Lysander, I will, my Hermia. So Hermia leaves. Galina, adieu. On him, Demetrius thought on you. So. He wishes Helena goodbye and wishes that as he loves Demetrius, Demetrius will also love her back. And he also leaves, leaving Helena alone. 
how happy some or other some can. Through Athens, I am thought as fair as she. Now, Helena, uh, noted that Helena now is left alone on stage, and she is solely alone. She pours out her mind. How happy some or other some can be. Through Athens, I am thought as fair as she. But what of that? He will not know what all but he do know. He is, doting on Hermia's eyes, so I, admiring of his qualities. So she says, well, throughout Athens, people see me to be as beautiful as Hermia is. But what, what, how important? Hermia is the only one, uh, Demetrius is the only one who does not think so. He is the only one who does not see what everybody else sees. And as he, he is, as he makes and rather loves Hermia, so do I also admire his qualities. So in other words, he's making the, she admits that she's making the same mistake that Demetrius is making. That is, Demetrius loves Hermia, who doesn't love her, who doesn't love him and he Helena is making the same mistake as of Demetrius who doesn't love her things base and vile love can transpose to form and dignity love knows with the eyes but with the mind love looks not with the eyes but with the mind and therefore is when Cupid painted blind nor had love's mind of any judgment tastes wings and no eyes figure unheeded tastes and therefore is love said to be because in choice he is so oft beguiled. So uh, Helena made the point clear. Helena made the point clear. Love can make work beautiful. When we are in love, we don't see with our minds. That is why paintings of Cupid, the god of love, always show him as blind. Because he's always painted as blindfolded. So love, that's why we always say love is blind. Because Cupid, the god of love, is always painted with uh, blindfolded. And love doesn't have good judgment either. Love, according to Helena, doesn't have good judgment. Why does he say so? Because, because Cupid has wings and no eyes. So he's bound to be reckless and hasty. Cupid holds his arrow and shoots blindfolded. So there's no judgment. That's why they say love is a child. Because it makes such bad choices. Because sometimes you fall in love with somebody that if you come to think of it carefully, yes. But simply because love is a child. And of course, a child make a wise choice. A child cannot make an informed choice. That is what was love according to Helena. Just as boys like to play, as waggish boys game themselves, for so the boy love is budget everywhere. For ere Demetrius looked on Hermia's eye, he hailed down oaths that he was only mine. And when this hail some from Hermia fell, so he dissolved, and showers of oaths did melt. So he says, just like the way boys play games by telling lies, his promises all the time. He says, before Demetrius saw Hermia, he showered on he, she, Helena promises and swore that he would forever belong to Helena. Like, boys, they will swear you, you, you will be the only one I will ever love. You will be the only one I will ever love. I can never leave you. A whole lot of sweet words. Yet a few days say, boy, will begin to love somebody else.
I will go tell him of fair Hermia's flight. Then to the wood will he tomorrow night pursue her. And for this intelligence, if I have thanks, it is I to enrich my pain. Sights, thither and back again. So now he says, I am going to tell him, that is Demetrius, about Hermia's plan to run away to elope. Once I tell him that, he will come to the forest, he will come to the bush, he will run after her. If he shows some gratitude to me for this information that I will give to him, it will be worth the pain in helping to chase my rival Hermia. At least when I do that, I'll get the opportunity to see him. Then again, when he comes back, at least I'll get to see him around. Then she leaves. Fancies to your father's will, 
or else the law that entitles you for to abolish the life. Come, my apologies. Demetrius is yes, go on. I must employ you in some business against our nuptial and confer on you something of which nearly that concerns yourself. How chance the roses there do fade so fast. You like the want of which I could well be teamed them from the tempest of my eye. Mm, a good persuasion. Therefore, I have a widow aunt, a dowager of great revenue, and she hath no child, promotes seven leagues, and she respects me as her only son. There, gentle Hermia, I to that place the sharp Athenian or Thou lovest me, then steal forth thy father's house tomorrow night, and in the wood a league without the town. There will I. My good Lysander, oh, I swear to thee, my Cupid's strongest bow, or the best arrow with the golden head, oh, by all of my... Oh, in that same place thou hast appointed me, will I need to see? I'll well, keep promise. Here comes Helen. God speed for Helen. Call you me fair, that fair again unsafe. Oh, happy fair, your eyes and your tongue sweet air more tunable than lark to shepherd's ear when wheat is green, when hawthorn buds appear. Sickness is catching. Oh, where favour so. Yours when I catch fair Hermia ere I go. My true voice, my eye, your eye. My tongue should catch your tongue's sweet melody. Where the world mine, I give to be to you translated. Oh, teach me, and with what art you sway the motion of Demetrius' heart. I frown upon him. <laughs> oh, that your frowns could teach my smile such skill. I give him curses. Yet he gives me. Oh, that my prayers could such affection move. More he hateth me. <laughs> it's no fault of mine. None but your beauty would that fault were mine. Take comfort. He no more shall see my face. But fly this plate. Helen and two, our minds we will devise. Tomorrow night, through Athens gates, have we devised to steal. And in the wood, there my Lysander and my son, hence from Athens, turn away our eyes to seek new friends and stranger companies. Oh, farewell, sweet plate. Pray thou for us. And good luck grant thee thy Demetrius. Starve our sight from lover's food until <laughs> Helena, adieu, as you on him, Demetrius, don't on you. <laughs> <laughs> from Act 1, Scene 2. Act 1, Scene 2. Here's a summary of Act 1, Scene 2. Six artisans meet to discuss what sort of entertainment they will prepare for Theseus' wedding. They decide to do a play about Pyramus and Thisbe. Act 1, Scene 2 takes place at Athens, Queen's house. Enter queens, snack, bottom, fruit, and traveling. And these are ordinary people who intend to perform a play of Theseus and Hippolyta. And in this scene, they are starting with the plans for the play. In other words, they are going to act a play. Queens. It's all our company here. So queens ask whether everybody. And you were best to call them. She asked. Bottom suggests that he should. Queens, here is a school of every man's name, fit through all attempts to play in our interlude at night. So he said that this is of the people who are fit, who are proper to take part in the play that they are going to perform at the wedding of Duke. And the Duchess in the night. But first, good Peter Queens, see what the play treats on. 
then read the names of the actors. So Bottom suggests that before he would even mention the name or the cast, he should tell them what the play is about and then give the, the part that each person is playing. Queens, Mary, our play is all right. Our play is the most lamentable comedy and most cruel. Play. Tell them the play is a very, a very tragic comedy. Comedy, or yes, a very tragic comedy. A very tragic comedy, horrible death of Pyramus and Thisbe. In other words, the play they are going to is a comedy that is it is meant to make people laugh. At the same time, a tragedy because people are going to die. That is and this way in the play. One wonders how a very good piece of work, I assure you. And then Mary. Now good Peter Queen's crew. As this, spread yourselves. Queens, answer as I call you. Name Bottom the Weaver. Bottom. Ready. Name what part I am for and proceed. Queens. Set down for Pyramus. So Nick Bottom is going to play the role of Pyramus in the play. Bottom. What is Pyramus? A love tyrant. Queens. A lover. That kills himself most gallant for love. So you know what the kind of the kind of character Pyramus is, whether he's a lover or he's a talent. And uh, Pyramus is a lover in a in a very gallant love. Bottom. That will ask some tears in the true performing of it. If I do it, let the audience look to the eye. I will move stones. I will condole in some measure to the rest. Yet my chief humor is for a tyrant. I could play Achilles rarely or a part to tear a cut in, to make all split. So now he says, well, that means I would have to make, there would have to be some shedding of tears. Then the audience should be careful because I am going to make them cry. I will do everything possible and I will make them cry. My best part actually is to play a part like the part of Hercules. To play the part of a tyrant. The raging rocks and shaving, shivering and shivering shocks shall break the locks of prison gates and feed the sky far and make and mar the foolish face. This was lofty. But the players, this is Hercules' vein, a tyrant's vein, a lover's, a lover is more condoned. So he said, uh, What I just said, what I just. Um, I was just saying, was uh, trying to in a role like that of Hercules, but the role of a lover would be much, much easier. So now call the rest of the the players, Queens. Francis Flute, the bellows mender. Here, Peter Queens. Flute, you must take this be on a wandering night. It is the lady that Pyramus must love. So he tells. Um, Queens tells Flute that he's going to play the role of, of course, he also wants to know what or who Tisby is. And he says, Tisby is a lady that uh, Pyramus must love. Flute, nay, faith, let me not play a woman. I have a beard coming. So Flute says, oh no, I can't play the role of a woman because beard, I have a beard that is coming. In those times, women were normally, so men, Role of women. Sometimes they would use a small boy to uh, to play the role of a woman because women were not performing on stage. That's all one. You shall play it in a mask. You may speak as small as you will. It says no, no, no problem. Uh, what beard or no beard? It shouldn't be a problem. You will wear a mask and you must try to speak as small. Bottom. And I may hide my face. Let me play this be too. I'll speak in a monstrous little voice. Disney, Disney. Ah, Pyramus. Ah, Pyramus, lover dear. Thy Tisby dear. And lady dear. So Bottom says, Well, why don't you let me play the role of uh, Tisby too? Like I will speak in a monstrous little voice. What is a monstrous little voice? Like, I will make my voice tiny. 
Queen says, no, no, you must play Pyramus. And flutes, you, this be. But well, proceed. Queens, Robin Stavlin, the tailor. Here, Peter Queens, Robin played this be's mother. Tom Snouts, the thinker. Here, Peter Queens, you, Pyramus' father. Myself, this be's father. Snap, the joiner, you, the lion's part. And I hope here is a play fated. Snap, have you the lion's part written? Pray you, if it be, give it me, for I am slow of steady. So, Queen says, uh, uh, Snack will play the role of the lion. And Snack says, well, you know I am slow in learning, so if I'm going to be a part of the lion, if you have, please give it to me, so that I will start studying it now. What could a part of a lion for? You may do it, Queen says, you may do it ex tempore. For it is nothing but rowing. He says, no, but the lion's part. You don't need any scripts because you are only going to row like a lion does. So you do it extempore. You don't need a script. But let me play the lion too. I will row that I will do any man's heart good to hear me. I will row that I will make the duke say, let him row again. Let him row again. Bottom wants to play virtually every part. Now he wants to play now he wants to play the lines. And you should do it too terribly. You would fright the Duchess and the ladies that they would shriek. And that were enough to hang us all. He says and don't uh, yes, if you play it you do it too terribly that you scare the Duchess and the other women. They will be afraid because of how you will row. All, everybody. That would hang us, every mother's son. Do that, and the ladies are afraid, then we will all be in trouble, they all say. But I grant you, friends, if that you should fight the ladies out of their wits, they would have no more discretion but to hang us. But I will aggravate my voice so that I will row you as gently as any sucking dove. I will row you and twere any light nightingale. I will go. So, Bottom says, well, then, me, I will do If I know that if we do it away and they get scared, it will mean trouble for all of us. But I will make my voice in such a way that my rowing will be like the sound of a nightingale, the bird nightingale. Queens, you can play Pyramus. For Pyramus is a sweet-faced man, a proper man, as one shall see in a summer's day. I must lovely... I must, a most lovely gentleman like man. Therefore, you must need to play. So, Queens insist that Bottom will play Pyramus. Well, I will undertake it. What beard were I best to play it in? Why? Wait, you will. Bottom. I will discharge it in either your straw color beard, your orange, tawny, green, green beard, or your French crown color beard, your perfect yellow. Bottom says he will wear a beard and mention different kinds of beard that he would wear just to perform that play. Either a straw color beard, or a sandy beard, or a red beard, or one of those bright yellow beards that's the color of the French coin. Queens, some of your French crowns have no hair at all, and then you will play bare faced. But masters, here are your parts, and I am to entreat you, request you, and desire you to con them by tomorrow night and meet me in the palace wood, a mile without the town, by moonlight. There will we rehearse. For if we meet in the city, we shall be docked with company and our devices known. In the meantime, I will draw a bill of properties such as our play wants. I pray you, fail me not. Bottom. Bottom. So now Queen says, um, well, some of the French crowns do not have hair at all. So he, Bottom, is going to perform bare face. He will not wear any mask. Then he says, 
everybody takes your parts. These are your scripts, the part that you are going to perform. And then he begs them and requests of them and desires them to learn their parts, to learn their scripts, so that by tomorrow night, they will all meet in the wood. And notice, note this. They are, you remember it is the same tomorrow night that um, Lysander and Hermia are meeting in the same forest a mile away. And the same tomorrow night, these actors are also going to the same bush around the same place. They are also the they, they want to rehearse in the forest, in the, in the wood, in the bush, because if they do it in the town, according to Queens, people would come around and see their play, and their play, and it would not be nice when they perform it again. So in the meantime, he's going to prepare the things that they would need for the play, the props. He's going to get them ready for the, for the play, and pleads with everybody not to fail. We will meet and there we will rehearse most obscenely and courageously. Take pains, be perfect, add you. Queens, and I do so, we meet. But enough, hold or cut bow strings. So they agree to meet or leave. You 
must needs play pibus and flute you his be. Well, proceed. Robin Starling, the sailor. Robin Starling, you shall play Thisby's mother. Tom Snout the Tinker. Here, Peter Quince. You must play Pyramus's father, myself, Thisby's father. Uh, Snout the Joiner. My mother. Here, I hope we have a very visitor. I did a reliance card written. Pray that. Why you may do it extempore, for it is nothing but roaring. And I may hide my face, let me play the lion too. I will roar you, but I will do any man's heart good to hear it. I will roar you, and the duke will say, oh, Let him roar again, let him roar again. Aye, you should do it too terribly that you would fright, that they would shriek, and that were enough to hang us all. That would hang us every mother's son. <laughs> if that you should drive the ladies out of their wits, they would have no more discretion but to act. But I, will, I will aggravate my voice, and I will roar you as gently as any sucking dove. I will roar you as twere a nightingale. <laughs> Hold a couple of strings. Well, uh, 